And we're on the air, not really, we're on the internet. And, um, <laughs> and we're almost ready to go. Edie's coming into the door. There she comes. Okay. So let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this new day, and we do thank you that we are able to wake up this morning, even if it feels like an hour earlier, and we thank you that we're able to meet here and continue to talk about Romans 1. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we discuss this passage and as we try to make sense of it in the world that we live in. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. I begin with a question this morning. When you hear this word nature, what do you think about? What's that? Grass. Trees, probably. What's that? Mother Nature. Water went down. Down <laughs> I thought we we're I wondered if we we're gonna have another 911 call this morning. <laughs> okay. So when when we think of nature, we we usually think of well, it's, it's kind of funny because when we say that, okay, yeah, okay, nature versus nurture. Well, there's, there's, there's some of that. Um, okay, so the opposite of nature when Edie thinks of it is uh, nurture. Um, if, if I would say my hair is natural, what do I mean and why do you believe me? Because it's gray. <laughs> okay, I have not colored what's left of my hair. I'm not wearing a toupee. I've not gotten hair implants. Well, it, it depends how much I paid. <laughs> if I say my beard is natural, you would look at that and say, you know, Paul looks very natural. Now, if I came in next week and suddenly I had my, the top of my head was covered with brown curly hair and my beard was all brown. Now, probably because you're all women, you would say, oh, Paul, you look so nice, because that's what women do. They, we were, my wife and I watch Survivor and I note often that um, women fight with a smile on their face. Men, not so much. Women smite with a, fight with a smile on their face. Oh, Paul, that looks so good. And on and on and on. So nature, we, we usually compare nature with, let's say, okay, nurture. Why? Now, now there's other things. Let's say um, intervention. Um, we go to... Yosemite National Park. Oh, here they come. Need some, need some help. There you go. Yeah, kick that kickstand down. That'll make it much easier. Yeah, no, yeah don't just get a running start and plop her out of the chair. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to go forward's a little easier. 
There we go. It kind of defeat the purpose if you threw her out of the chair getting over the door sill. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, welcome, Delphine and, and Lil. Yeah. <laughs> you made it indeed. So we're, we're talking about this funny word, nature. And I, I asked if everyone thought my hair was natural, and you all quite easily agreed. Um, I asked if my beard was natural, and you all quite easily agreed. Let me ask you, um, so when we say we want to get out into nature, so under nature we might also say wilderness. And wilderness might be contrasted with city, or park. What's a park? Controlled. Controlled nature. It's sort of an established thing. It's nature on a leash. It's nature that's been trimmed. Now, nurture, Edie thinks of nature versus nurture. So what do we mean by nurture, and how is it different from nature? Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at one of my favorite books is C.S. Lewis's Miracles. And he talks about, well, he's, this is early in the book, and he's, he's talking about, I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature, notice he capitalizes N, by supernatural power. So we today have this idea of natural and supernatural. What's supernatural? Okay. When you get a dog, um, you want to train the dog. What does that mean? Um, Carmen, could you ask her? She might be looking for the bathroom. She was over in the front of church, and um, she probably doesn't know that there are bathrooms across the way. It's really difficult. Women, homeless women, homeless who are women, it's a different thing than with the men. And... Um, She's trying to change her clothes and relieve herself, all that stuff out in front of the church. I said, why don't, why don't you come in and use the bathroom? You can change your clothes. You can relieve yourself. Everything will be a lot better. And um, why is Maury looking? Okay, good, 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 Carmen. And, and then she was, this was an hour ago that we started this process, and she took an hour to pack up everything and get ready. So I saw her over there. I thought, probably doesn't know where the bathroom is. Okay. So, so um, now actually I want to, let's talk about supernatural. Natural and human. Now, if I set it up this way, can we have an understanding of 
what natural and supernatural and human are. So let's say, let's use a dog. A natural dog. Do you want a natural dog in your home? No, you don't, do you? I was, I, I visited Rick yesterday and met his dog, Wiley, and um, we, we talked about the fact that he, he had the, he had the, uh, he had the dog shake his hand, these little tricks. And I, I was watching a dog trainer on YouTube and the dog trainer said, the dog pound is full of dogs that can shake hands and roll over. What did the dog trainer mean? They are taught these things, but what are the real things you want to do when you bring a dog into your home? Well, you want a trained dog. And by trained dog, you want a dog who has figured out how to live with human beings, which means going to tell you he's housebroken. Let's do cat. cats. Are not, cats are not trained. Cats do what they want. <laughs> dogs, um, dogs, dogs are amazing creatures because dogs get us almost like no other animal. And we can create a relationship with a dog that is very different from relationships with most other animals. So when we have a trained dog, well, that dog signals when the dog has to go outside. The dog is housebroken. The dog knows how to sit and stay. The dog knows not to be too jealous about the dog dish. So if you have a dog and, let's say, a toddler, you want the dog to understand that if the toddler goes near the dog dish, the dog doesn't bite the toddler. Even though if there were two dogs, the dog might be jealous about the dog dish. It's all of this training that we do in the dog, and dogs are fairly good at that. It's domesticated. Oh. That goes under human. Domesticated. What is supernatural? The talking dog. There we go. The talking dog is supernatural. What's the difference between the domesticated dog and the talking dog? Brain function. I mean, there, there are times when my dog, before he died, it was like, the, the dog is almost trying to talk to us. The dog's like, rawr, 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 and, and we, we know that the dog is frustrated, and we know that the dog wants something, but spit it out, Mookie, you know? But the dog can't talk. So, supernatural, now this term is only a couple hundred years old. Hmm. That's unusual. Why would that term only be a couple hundred years old? Nature, that's a very old word. We're going to talk about that word. Human and nature, well, when E says nurture, She's meaning parenting. So a child, you bring the baby, the baby home from the hospital. You are going to put in hours and hours and hours and hours and hours into that baby in a strange way to make that baby human. It isn't that the baby isn't human. But you know that the baby is somehow, well, can you have a human being that is more like an untrained dog? What does that look like? <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. Homeless people can't live with other human beings. In other words, Ah, now I've been drawing this little arc quite often lately, and I've been drawing this little arc quite often lately, 
And oh, what's this about? I did. I did. This is the arena. And this is the agent. Now let's maybe draw a dog. Um, give him a little tail. A dog in the home has to be domesticated, trained, so that the dog can function in the home. The dog is subservient to the rules of the arena. The dog knows what is and isn't proper in a context. And humans create that arena, don't we? Now, a human being that is wild doesn't understand the rules of the context. Someone comes into church. There's a way that we suppose they should behave when they're in a church. Someone comes into this room. There's a way that we should propose propose they behave in this room. Now, in this room, before COVID, um, what was his name? I don't remember his name right now. But one of the guys would come in often, and he would talk all the time in the middle of the class, right? He's a schizophrenic, and he lived with his mom, and he would just keep talking during the class. And I would ask him, settle down. He'd just keep talking. Now, his schizophrenia impacted his ability to function within the arena. Now, this is the predominant way we think about this term, natural. C.S. Lewis, I use this word miracle to mean interference with nature by a supernatural power. Unless there exists, in addition to nature, something else which we might call the supernatural, there are no miracles. And so we think in these terms. But the supernatural term is very new, and we haven't thought about that for very long. A little bit later, Lewis says, well, so he's talking about miracles and super miracles in the modern realm and why people disagree with miracles. And before the naturalist and the supernaturalist can begin to discuss their difference of opinion, they must surely have an agreed upon definition of both nature and supernature. But unfortunately, it is almost impossible to get such a definition. Just because the naturalist thinks that nothing but nature exists, the word nature seems to him merely everything, or the whole show, or whatever there is. And if that is what we mean by nature, then of course, nothing else exists. The real question between him and the supernaturalist evades us. So then he gives some definitions of natural. I begin by considering the following sentences. Number one. Are those his natural teeth or a set? I had the same question with respect to the hair, right? My natural teeth, I've never had braces, but just this last week, I had an intervention in my natural teeth. I went to the dentist and had a cleaning. What if I never go to the dentist and have a cleaning? Yeah, yeah, I might very quickly have no teeth. But, see, we begin to recognize that, well, what's the deal with our teeth? Well, you don't really have to go to the dentist, maybe if you are flossing regularly and brushing regularly, but that's intervention. And then someone might say, well, wait a minute, before we had dentists and toothbrush and floss, did people's teeth fall out all the time? Well, yes and no, they did fall out, but part of why our teeth fall out is what? In the, our diet. Hmm. What did we discover in the 16th century that changed our teeth? Sugar. Before we had sugar, See, there's all of these things that affect the teeth. So, ah, notice I had human and natural. 
Now, what do we possess that is at the heart? Well, let's read a couple more of these definitions from Lewis. Um, the dog in his natural state is covered with fleas. What does nature mean there? No, no human intervention. Well, why do we care if the dog has fleas? Ah, we have this perspective. We, in a sense, transcend ourselves out of nature and see the world and have goals. We don't want the dog pooping and peeing on the floor. Why is this camera not focused? Hey, Rick, why is the camera not focused? There we go. Never mind. It's not your fault. Um, we don't want the dog pooping and peeing on the floor because we have an idea about why, how we want our house to run. Now, this is some dominion that we're showing over this. I love to get away from tilled land and metalled roads and be alone with nature. That's what we started talking about. Do be natural. Why are you so affected? That's a harder, that's a harder example. Because the language is a little different from what we use now. This book was written about 70 years ago. Do be natural. Why are you so affected? Please be natural. Why are you so affected? In other words, why like we today we might say, why? Why so much drama? What are you reacting to? In other words, the natural thing to be is under the arena, let's call it of civilization. Yeah, that's right. When you come into the classroom, you are expected to sit down, maybe have some papers or a Bible, listen carefully, only respond when the invitation is given. Now, that is not natural. Where did you learn this? School, home. Children must be seen and not heard. It's a Victorian idea. It's a way of attempting to socialize. Now, we've got all kinds of things about that, but okay. So back to Lewis. It might have been wrong to kiss her, but it was very natural. How about that statement? What does that mean? Brings in ethics. That's right. So it was very natural to kiss her. What does that mean? What, what, is, what, is, what is the little story that is evoked by that sentence? Oh, that's right. Oh, she's beautiful. Grab her and kiss her. Well, what, what little pauses should have happened before the grabbing and kissing? Thinking, ah, so what we're seeing here is this human, and this is really the point of C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, that thinking, reason, this, this cognitive capacity that we have that the dog doesn't have, that the child has to develop and grow into, all of these ideas are about Okay, before I grab her and kiss her, number one, does she want to be kissed? Hmm. Number two, am I married? Hmm. Number three, is she married? Hmm. Number four, is this an appropriate place for a kiss? I mean, those are just the top four. They can go on from there. But natural means... This is what I feel my body telling me. Okay.
what to the the reaction to kiss it's natural and we might say it's natural because and we've developed lengthy stories about this because when we look at what a human is in our culture we say and and even the way i've told you the story reinforces this a human is an animal plus reason. Now, there's a very ancient philosophical way of thinking about a human in this way. And it comes up repeatedly throughout history. So a dog is animal. A trained dog basically borrows our reason and it is imposed upon the reason uh, upon the dog by training and then a dog becomes a little more than human a little more than animal when the dog is trained that's how we think and so natural is below and see this gets very old theologically too because roman catholics for example had grace and nature and that was a that's a very classical Roman Catholic approach to thinking about the world. And so what we do with the dog is we add grace to the dog and the dog can be more than the dog naturally is. Okay? And and when applied in Roman Catholic and medieval theology, a human is animal and by God's grace Humans can become more than what they are, and so basically you have a hierarchy here where, and, and C.S. Lewis in his book sort of runs through this, it's classically God gives reason to us and we put reason out into the world. And that's sort of what you get with, well, God is supernatural then you have human and you have natural. And basically what you have there is a hierarchy of reason. And reason is this capacity of dominance whereby I see a piece of chocolate cake. I want the piece of chocolate cake. That chocolate cake has been engineered by globalization. What do I mean by that? What do you need to make chocolate? You need cocoa, sugar, wheat, <laughs> and a whole lot of civilization to make chocolate. Chocolate is a product of the Columbian exchange, whereby Christopher Columbus in that age of discovery, the world was brought together. So now we can take cocoa from South America, cane from islands in the Pacific, and wheat from Mesopotamia, and domesticated chicken eggs, and we can actually make chocolate cake. And we have engineered that chocolate cake, maybe next to it is a loaf of bread. Oh, well, loaf of bread is good. But chocolate cake is loaf of bread plus a lot of civilization designed to <gasps> inflame my desires. Sugar, fat, wheat, carbs, milk, cream, all of that put together in a powerful thing. I could stop there because I've... I've now, where does reason kick in? Okay. The, 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 re the natural reaction to the chocolate cake is to run at it. I mean, we play with one-year-olds, right? We give them a birthday cake. We, we put a piece of chocolate cake right in front of them. And what does the one-year-old do with that chocolate cake? 
hands, mouth, all over the place. We take pictures of it and we laugh and it's cute because they're wild. Now, as an almost 60-year-old man, I look at that chocolate cake and reason kicks in. And what kinds of things do I start saying? <laughs> exactly. Reason, hmm, maybe a little piece, not too much, just a taste. I don't need that much. All that reason. Okay, so there you have. Now, is chocolate cake bad? No. It might be bad for me. And if I'm a diabetic, even worse. But it's not bad. It's really amazing. So this is, for us today, the definition of nature, of the word nature. And this causes for us a difficulty in reading the text that we want to read this morning. Okay. We're going to start with... Verse 21 that we talked about last week. Ever, or verse 20. Ever since the creation of the world, his, meaning God's, invisible nature, oh boy, there's that word once. We're going to bump into that word a lot in these next few verses. And it's going to touch on something that most of you, once I start talking about it, your blood pressure is going to go up. We're in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. His invisible, his invisible nature, his eternal power and deity has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. Okay? Now, if we think in these, ter in these terms, God, reason, animal, nature, grace... Okay, that sort of works. So they are without excuse. Okay. For although, I'm going to switch over to the NIV here. For although they knew God, we talked about that, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why a word like darkened? What's the opposite of dark? Light. And light allows you go into a room and it's dark. What will likely happen? Well, you, you'll bang into something. Now remember, up until what century couldn't you simply turn on a light? 20th. This is really recent. Most of the world, when it got dark, there's only one way to bring light into a room, and what was that way? Fire. But fire, I mean, today, when there's a blackout, everybody gets a little nervous. Why? Right. And so a lot of people use candles. Now, candles provide light, but... They're dangerous. All you need is that curtain to get a little close to the candle or to fall asleep with the candle burning or something to happen. That fire, which brings light, can also bring death. Fire is a dominant theme, an image of God in the Bible. I am a consuming fire, the burning bush. So darkness is... Well, you can't use reason in a dark room very well, can you? You have to sort of, okay, I'm going to remember where the couch is and how many steps is the couch. And, oh, yeah, I've got that pitcher of water on the table that I really don't want to knock over and on and on and on and on and on. In other words, in some sense, your reason has to really go hyper. But if you could just see, you would walk around the couch and not pit, not knock over the pitcher of water. Although they claimed, who's they? Uh, 
Okay. Well, what's, what's the context here? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Those people. Now, actually, what we're going to get into chapters 1, 2, and 3, in chapters 1, Paul's mostly talking about pagans. In chapter 2, Paul will be talking about Jews. And in chapter 3, he's going to talk about Jews and pagans together. Okay? Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. We talked about that last week. You remember what we talked about last week with why the gods looked like animals? Why does Israel, why does the God of Israel say, you shall have no other God before me? You shall not make for yourself a graven image of anything in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters. Why are, is Israel, all the other nations have statues of people and calves and snakes and all sorts of other sometimes composite beings with people with wings and things like that. Why does Israel not allow to make images like that and say, there's God? He's not only above the arena. He works through the arena. Jer Isaiah goes into the temple. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That means you can't take anything in the world and say, that's God. He's above it. Holy, holy, holy. He's separate. The whole earth is full of his glory. Oh, there's the glory of God in some ways in that table. Now you might say, what do you mean the glory of God is in that table? Well, try living without a table for a few years. You would say, oh, my kingdom for a table. I just want to sit down and have my plate in front of me and have my glass sit still. The glory of God is in that table. I'm just so used to it, I don't pay any attention to it. But take tables away from you and you will long for a table and you'll desire a table. And the glory of God is in that table. The whole earth is full of his glory. His glory is all over the place. So you can't take one thing and say, that's God, because that's a reduction of God. Okay. So what they did was they tried to approximate God by elevating, we talked about Dr. Freud, elevating something in the world and putting it on top. All right. Therefore, God gave them over. Now that term right there, gave them over, we're going to find that three times. We're going to find it in verse 24. Look at verse 26. God gave them over in verse 28. Furthermore, blah, blah, blah. So God gave them over. He's going to repeat that again and again and again. Well, what does that mean? If you give your child over to, in some ways, the animal that is in your child, what does that look like? Tell me a story. You quit trying to teach them. You don't discipline them. You let them go their own way. Let's say you have a curfew for your child. Why would you have a curfew for your child? For your own peace of mind, one. For their sake. Well, what, what, so, so what if your kid wants to stay out all night? Oh, <laughs> nothing good happens in the dark. Nothing good happens after 11. Nothing good happens. Now, now that's not true. Lots of good things happen in the dark. Kid probably came into the world after dark. 
Well, no, in daylight, that's right. <laughs> so we're saying is that you should be home by 11 because you don't know how to handle the power that is in you and out there. And so I'm going to put a curfew on you and I am going to limit your fun. Well, I, I, I don't want my fun limited. Okay, I'm going to give you over to the desires that are within you that you are wishing to pursue after your curfew. I'm going to give you over to those desires. Okay, now, this is the problem we have with, in reading this text today. This word natural, words are not dead things. What do I mean by that? Words are living things. What's, the di what's one difference between living things and dead things? Living things change and move and can go on. The word natural is a very ancient word, and it has been changing and moving significantly in the last thousand years. This text was written almost 2,000 years ago, and there are Greek words underneath the English words. My favorite example of this is in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, and now if I can somehow figure out how to spell. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Now, when you were a kid and played Life or Monopoly, you wanted to own a mansion. What is a mansion? A huge house. Now, the reason we the reason we talk about that is because that's the translation of the King James Version. Anybody know when the King James Version was translated? 1605. A long time ago. This word mansion has changed in the last 400 years. It didn't mean big house where the Monopoly guy lives with pillars and rooms and servants. It meant something more like a place to sleep overnight, a way, a way station, almost a rest area. Huh. Well, but then when you hear that, in my father's house, there are many rooms. And modern translations, often that'll say, in my father's house, there are many rooms, or many bedrooms, or many guest rooms, something like that, which locates that into our world. Now, people, if you bring them the new Bible as opposed to the old Bible, and they turn to that and say, I'm really mad at this new Bible. This new Bible is wrong, because I grew up reading this, in my father's house, there are many mansions. These new editors of the Bible took away my mansion. Your mansion wasn't there to begin with. And now, it doesn't mean any lesser thing about what awaits for us in Christ. It just means the definition of the word has changed. The definition of this word, natural, has changed. But often when these words change, they don't change completely. What's in common between mansion and a big house and guest room. Guest room. It, that place to sleep. It hasn't changed completely, but it's changed enough that people get the wrong idea. Okay. Therefore, God gave them over. All right, well, if we think about our young person who doesn't like a curfew. God gave them over. Well, didn't God give them over to what was natural? Because for your teenager, what, what, what kinds of things is your teenager going to do after 11? Let's list some of them. Drink. Isn't it natural to want to drink? What's natural about drinking? You drink and depending on your physiology, you might feel happy. 
You, you're, a, you're an inhibited teenager because the world is mysterious, and so you find yourself being self-conscious, and you realize that your self-consciousness and your inhibitions are getting in the way of having the fun that others are having, so you drink, and suddenly you're not inhibited anymore. And you're the life of the party, and everybody rewards you for being the life of the party. Oh, so I want to drink. Drinking happens after 11. How about sex? Is sex unnatural? No, sex is really natural. You know, I want to kiss her. It's very natural. Sexual desire is very natural. Now, we might also say that sexual desire is sort of animal. You have the dog in the house and certain dogs. Why is that dog humping the chair? Now, if you domesticate and train a dog, you'll say, Mookie, stop that. And the dog stops. You've just reinforced the domestication of that animal. No humping in the house, Mookie. So the teenager wants to stay out after 11 to be uninhibited by drinking alcohol and maybe having sex and maybe doing all sorts of things. And you as a parent says, home by 11. Well, is sex bad? It can be. <laughs> it isn't in and of itself. It is natural. But now this is our thinking of the word. And when we get into what we're going to talk about here, You'll see why we're going to talk about this. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires. Now, this is this Greek word that I talk about often, epithumia. Thumia just means desire. You're hungry. You see a loaf of bread to eat it and nourish you. That's desire. In some ways, chocolate cake is epithumia. It's got cocoa, caffeine. It's got sugar, raw energy. It's got fat. Oh, we desire fat. It's got carbs. It's got everything. And if you're starving, a piece of chocolate cake or a candy bar is really good for you because it's like whoosh energy into your body. But if you're eating chocolate cake every day, not so good. Epithuma, epithumia, you have these Greek prepositions. Epithumia means over desire. Oh, I want the chocolate cake. No, you should want to eat. You shouldn't want to eat. So, therefore, God gave them over to their over-desires. You're sick of fighting with that teenager, and you say, stay out as late as you want. Now, when you've gotten to that point as a parent, what has happened? You've, you've basically assumed a harder road than the initial one you wanted for them. If you listen to me, if you take discipline, you will have an easier way in life. So the teenager stays out. Suddenly, ooh, he's got a DUI. Oh, that's going to cost you. Oh, there's an unplanned pregnancy. Oh, that's going to cost you. And you begin realizing, oh my goodness, this teenager is in the span of a few short years because of their epi desire, building things into their life that they are going to literally spend decades dealing with. DUI, eh? you know, five years restricted license, higher insurance rates. Uh, five years, if they keep their record clean, they'll get over it. Unplanned pregnancy? Wow. At least 18 years. Lifetime. It's going to be ups and downs. It's going to be good and bad. But I didn't want that for you, but I gave you over. 
to your epithumias. Now, you didn't want to learn in the short and compressed way. Now you will learn in the hard way. Okay. So they gave them over to their sinful desires, their epithumias of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Well, the Greek is getting a little complicated here. We'll go back to the LEB. Therefore, God gave them over in the desires of their hearts to immorality, that their bodies would be dishonored amongst themselves. Hmm. Okay, so your teenager is staying out late and your teenager is playing around with sex. How are these teenagers dishonoring their bodies amongst themselves? Why did you have, why did you with your teenager try to put restrictions on their access even to their own bodies? Well, that sounds tyrannical. Maybe it's because you wanted someone to honor your teenager's body and you wanted your teenager to honor their body and that honor would have resulted in a little bit more order with respect to their sexuality. So let's say your teenager is a girl and they go out and no, oh, she's partying and she's drinking and oh, there's this boy that I really liked and oh, we're going to sleep together and then next week, why are you so upset, sweetheart? I don't want to talk about it. What do you want to talk about? Eventually, I liked him. And we slept together. And now he won't call me. What does she feel? Dejected. She has been dishonored. She and her partner have dishonored each other. Now, this is a really deep thing because when we get into the sexual revolution, the sexual revolution has been liberation. Well, shouldn't she be free to do with her body what she pleases? But is she wise enough to know how to honor something that she hasn't fully been able to grasp. That's right. Add alcohol to that. Now she's chemically in, uninhibited. Maybe that inhibition that you had wasn't something you should have thrown away. Maybe there was some wisdom in that inhibition that would have made you pause and so you wouldn't have fallen into the dishonor. There's a, great, there's a great thing in the New York Times about, you know, for a while, okay, so we're going to build this honor into all of this permission giving. And so there's this whole thing about you've got these unmarried people and they're going to give permission to each other. Okay, can I kiss you now? Yes, you can kiss me. Okay, can I do this to you now? Yes, you can do this. Okay, can you do that? And in the New York Times, it's talking about this girl, this woman is talking about how she had this date with a man, and at every point of the sexual advance, he asked permission, and she said yes. Well, this was our answer to, 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 to honoring. But then he went home, and he didn't call her the next day. And she's like, I don't, I don't understand what happened. He, I, I still feel dishonored. Oh, because... Built into this reality was something, was an end, was a goal that you weren't even aware of. You were hoping for a storybook romance that you would live together happily ever after. And that was built into the intimacy that you were craving. Now, we're going to have to get into this more next week. Because this is where this word natural has changed. Because we could say it was her natural desire that, that meant that she would desire that young man. Yeah, that was absolutely natural. But this word natural 
in the ancient way, the word comes from, basically, it comes from the word physis in Greek, which basically means to grow. Remember how, how wrath was to swell and piety was to shrink? Well, this is grow as in a plant. Now, when we think about nature and grow, we think about the process. In the ancient world, when you have, let's say, a little seed and it's germinating underneath the ground and it's going to grow, the ancient world, they think about, let's say it's a sunflower, they think about the end or the purpose or the destiny. The end or purpose of destiny of germination is the plant. It's the fullness of what that will become. When we think nature, we think process through time. And the difference between that, so I'll give you a little heads up into why I'm being so careful about this. Verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Well, that's just like verse 24. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. To go back into something a little closer to the Greek in the LEB, God gave them over to degrading passions. It's a little different from epithumia. It's pathe, um, dishonoring passions. For their females exchanged their natural relations for those contrary to nature. Now, if you read this text today, this is one of these fighting texts about same-sex relationships. If you read this text today, in the modern combat zone, people will say, well, it is natural for a same-sex attracted person to desire someone of the same sex. That is natural. And if you go back to the modern definition of natural, you would have to say, yeah. But Paul says, it's not natural. So, where did it come from? And what are we talking about? And the key here is in the migration of the meaning of the word natural. Because in the 15th and 16th century, something happened that made nature non-purposive. That made nature random. Remember how I keep drawing this arc and talking about the story? In the modern world, nature is without purpose. Or, in a Darwinian frame, the only purpose of nature is the continuity of nature. That is not the perspective of the Christian world. The Christian world says, what do I keep putting up here? God. Nature. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That glory has a destination and a purpose. And it isn't just, it was natural to kiss her. Okay, so it's natural. Should you have? See, even the contemporary story about sexuality, notice that on one hand, everybody wants to talk about liberty, and while we're talking about liberty, we're adding all these new rules. So the young man dating the woman, okay, can I hug you? Yes, you can hug me. Can I kiss you? Yes, you can kiss me. Can I undo your blouse? Yes, you can undo my blouse. Have you ever imagined anything so unromantic than that? I mean, we're all adults in this room. No, this is liberty. It's not liberty. It's legal. 
So what is sexuality for? And we're going to have to talk about that next week. But why all this talk about the word natural? Look at how many times this word natural is in this text go out of this classroom and into these big fights right now in the culture and in the church, all of the fights are about this word natural. If you don't understand what Paul meant by the word, and you just use today's word, in my house, many house, there are many mansions. Why are you taking away my pillared palace? It's because the word didn't mean that. Well, Paul was wrong. Okay, well, if you want to say that, you can say that. But at least pay attention to the words you're using and what they mean and what you mean by the word and what Paul meant by the word and how this fits into the picture today. So, all right, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word and for grace. And Lord, this stuff is really hard because we have to use words to navigate and we have nature. It's a very old word. And we're trying, Lord, to figure out what is good, what will bring shalom in all of the various directions. So help us, Lord, as we continue to navigate this, to figure out how to honor you and how to live gratefully in your presence. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.